Senior Conservation Officer. Um, I'm normally found out and about uh, working on our priority Lepidoptera, of which there are many in Scotland. Um, so I spend most of my time out talking with uh, landowners and with their advisors, with uh, representatives from Nature Scott and Forestry and Land Scotland, working alongside our wonderful army of volunteers, trying to enhance the populations of some of our rarer Lepidoptera. Um, so this is uh, very much out of my comfort zone. Uh, Craig got me on a very weak moment, which uh, I obviously have a lot of when I um, agreed to give this talk. Um, so I, it was very much a, a learning exercise for me. So what I'm about to present is certainly not my own work. It's a collaboration of different talks and slides and other information I've gleaned primarily from uh, colleagues at Butterfly Conservation Scotland and elsewhere, uh, particularly other colleagues uh, who work for BC further south. So please uh, bear with me um, and I'll attempt to uh, you know, answer any questions at the end. But as I say, um, I'm by no means an expert. I'm very, very new to this, uh, this topic. So let's uh, let's start where I started, really, uh, by going to, to primary school and, uh, you know, what is pollination? Just bear with me. I'm clicking my mouse, but my slides are not moving along. <laughs> the arrow keys on your on your keyboard, perhaps, Tom? Oh, uh, yeah, OK, I'll try that. Yeah, sorry. Well, the, I mean, the first one's obviously come up, but uh, the various uh, pictures and things that I was hoping would uh, then appear and my neck. Oh, uh, my, oh, here we go. You can see I've been clicking like mad. <laughs> Whoa. So um, whether it's my internet connection or not, I'm not sure, but uh, obviously there's a bit of a, a, well, a fair lag between me clicking my button and something appearing on the screen. Oops, and now my screen has gone. No, I'm, I'm sorry about this, Craig, but uh, I can see now all the participants, but not my shared screen has gone. So I'll yeah. open it. I'll open it up again and share it. Yeah, there you go. Right. OK, so hopefully everybody can see that. I will click to the next slide and fingers crossed it will work. Yes. And again. Right. OK. So yes, so let's go back to primary school and uh, pollination. Um, so for all flowering plants, um, the, because they can't move around or most of them, um, they are reliant on reproducing by setting seed. And because they can't move, uh, the way they overcome that is to use pollen, which moves from the female part of the flower or in some plants the actual female flower because some species have different uh, female flowers to male flowers and the um, the pollen goes from the male flower to the female flower. You can see there a uh, sort of microscopic image of uh, all the different or some of the different types of pollen. Um, uh, very very amazing structures um, and the female then receives that pollen from the male and then seeds are produced. So a, a fairly simple process. Um, and obviously the, the, the main importance of this is that it increases the genetic diversity of the, of the plants by this cross pollination. And uh, greater genetic diversity, diversity is very important on the whole for healthier plants and those that are more able to adapt to our ever-changing environmental conditions. So a very, very vital and important um, process. So how does the pollen you know, travel from the, the, uh, the male to the female? Well, one way is uh, abiotic, which is a non-living non method. So this is reliant on things like water, but particularly by the wind. 
So if you take a lot of our evergreen trees, uh, things like Scots pine and larch, when they're in flower, if you brush against them, you get this dust. You can also see this on uh, on puddles and pools in amongst the sort of forestry tracks. And this is the pollen being uh, being dispersed by the male flowers in the hope that it will land on the female flowers. And obviously grass is, is uh, the, all the wonderful and numerous species of grasses are also all pollinated by the wind. And uh, sadly, because of this, those of us that suffer from hay fever, um, yes, we would rather not have um, abiotic pollination. Now, only 12% of all plants um, pollinate by this method. The vast majority of them use biotic. So they're, they're using animals to pollinate. Now, in the tropics, then there's bats and lizards and uh, hummingbirds and other exotic animals. I'm not aware in Scotland anyway of any animals that are purposefully pollinating our plants, but I could be wrong. So most of the animals or, or mammals or birds rather, most of the animals or all the animals in Scotland that are pollinating plants will be insects, um, particularly uh, bees, hoverflies, and as you'll find out later, uh, butterflies and moths. Now, if we go into a little bit more detail about pollination, again, it's like going back to, uh, to school. Uh, the insects, in this case, the bumblebees, they're attracted to the flower. And the reason they're attracted to the flower is, well, look, numerous reasons. There'll be scent, there'll be the, the colour, but the main reason is the, the, is the nectar. So the insects are attracted to the, to the nectar of the plant to feed. In doing so, they then brush against the, the pollen on the stamens. And as they then fly from plant to plant, the sticky pollen, which adheres to certain parts of their bodies, is then brushed off on the female part of the next plant. And it therefore then helps to pollinate the plant. So, that, that is the, how pollination works. So these are the types of species that we find in Scotland that are sort of generalists that are out there um, visiting flowers and by doing so uh, pollinating our plants. So the main pollinators are uh, honeybees and other bees in the bottom left, uh, bumblebees, and you can see the bumblebee at the top left completely covered in pollen. Uh, top right we've got hoverflies so these are all very important uh, pollinators um, and there in the middle we have a, a wonderful old lady uh, moth, day flying moth primarily, an orange tip butterfly and to the right a painted lady butterfly. So all these are generalist uh, pollinators. Um, they're there, they're maintaining our genetic diversity of plant populations. And the other key thing is that because these insects are all very mobile, they can move over you know, reasonable distances. And in the case of species like painting, la painted ladies, over considerable distances. And therefore they can share the, ge the genetic material of the plants between otherwise isolated populations. So that's a really key important um, aspect of pollination by insects, the fact that they can do it over a large scale, over, over a sort of landscape, if not, if not further. Now, there are a number of specialist uh, pollinators. I will mention a Scottish one um, towards the end of my talk. The, probably one of the most famous ones is, is the fig wasp, um, which is, here's its life history. If we look at uh, uh, number one here. I don't know whether you can see my cursor on the on the screen here, but uh, as we go round this life cycle, here's the wasp. And what the wasp does, it goes into the figs. It go, there's a tiny hole at the base of the fig, and it crawls into that. This is what the female uh, wasp does. And in doing so, its wings tend to fall off because the actual flowers of the fig are inside the plant. So the female wasp has crawled in, knocked her wings off, and she's then crawling around inside the plant, and then she's laying her eggs 
in in the um, um, inside the, the tiny flowers these then hatch into the grubs their grubs then feed on the pollen and on the nectar when the males then emerge they then make a wee tunnel you can see here a little tunnel that's made from the center of the fruit to the outside it then crawls back in they it then mates with its siblings and then when the female wasps then emerge, not all the, some of the flowers will still be retained and won't have been eaten, and they still have pollen on them. And in doing so, and in trying to get out from the fig uh, fruit, the female carries the pollen, flies out of the fruit, and then goes then, having already mated inside the fruit, then flies off to another, another fruit tree. And that's how the life cycle of the wasp, which is integral in the uh, pollination of the of the fig. So a really, really close relationship between the fig wasp and the fig. And another example, uh, a very famous example is the Star of Bethlehem orchid or known as Darwin's orchid. This orchid was uh, first found um, in Madagascar in the 1800s. And when a specimen was sent to Charles Darwin in 1862, um, he postulated that uh, the only way that this wonderful orchid could be pollinated was through a moth that would have to have a proboscis of 30 centimetres long or 25 to 30 centimetres long because the nectar is down at the tip of this tube and to reach that the moth would have to put its head in the, into the mouth of the, the flower, put its proboscis down into the tube and in doing so to, re to receive that nectar it would be flying from plant to plant with the pollen which would adhere to its body. And lo and behold, uh, about 40 years later, the moth was found. Um, but it took another 90 years, really, so 130 years since Darwin proposed this theory for it actually to be proved that when it was found in 1992, that this particular moth, Xanthopan morgani, was actually um, watched and observed in the field nectaring and therefore upon and therefore pollinating uh, Darwin's um, Star of Bethlehem orchid. So again a very very close relationship between the plant and in this case the moth. So how important are Lepidoptera in terms of pollinating our crops? There's a, a huge amount in the news at the moment, uh, and there has been for a while, about uh, the importance of pollinators of our crops. Well, um, yes, there it's said it all. Leave it to the bees. So plants like, as illustrated here, you know, our strawberries, our uh, oilseed rape, beans, uh, various types of fruit, um, they are all pollinated by bees, whether that's bumblebees, uh, honeybees, wasps or hoverflies. Um, and the, so these groups have been very, very well studied for these commercial crops. And certainly it's been found that effective pollination of these crops, um, you know, particularly things like courgettes and apples and oilseed rape, um, lead to um, greater or bigger uh, fruits um, and better quality fruits. So when it comes to, to crops um, and, and fruit, you know, the, the, the bees have got it covered. So I can't claim that our Lepidoptera are really contributing um, to any of the pollination of our, of our fruit. But where they can help is with the pollination of our natural habitats. So most of the rest of my talk you'll see that there's various references somewhere on the slide and these are sort of bits of these are various studies that I have gleaned or I've been told about where hopefully I'll be able to sort of partake a little bit of uh, a very very short summary of some of the work that has happened in these in these areas. So in this particular case this particular study um, this was undertaken, I think, in Sweden on some wonderful flower rich meadows. 
And what the researchers did, you can see in the background there, some light little uh, pop up clear through tents where they went to parts of this meadow and they restricted f insects, particularly flying insects into some of these areas. And then they studied the seed um, on the flowers within and the flowers without. And unsurprisingly, um, they found that by excluding the pollinating insects, there was a greater reduction in the in the amount of seed that was set, the number of seedlings that therefore resulted, and also in the overall plant diversity. So it shows that uh, having pollinators there really contributes to our uh, to the to the biodiversity of these species rich meadows. Another study that was looking at data in uh, in both Britain and in over in the, the Netherlands. Um, was looking at the declines. Sadly, a lot of our plants and a lot of our invertebrates are in quite dramatic decline. So, for instance, uh, if you take macro moths over the last 40 years, um, data from butterfly conservation has showed that two thirds of our common species, our common and, and formerly widespread species are in decline. And this is particularly so in the southern half of, uh, of Britain. And what this study here found by looking at the declines in, in the pollinators and those plants that uh, require pollination, species that were self-pollinated, there was no real noticeable decline. Species that are pollinated abiotically, therefore by the, by the wind or by water, um, had actually increased. But those that have been pollinated by insects, not only were the part, plants in decline, but so were their uh, associated pollinated insects. If we now go on to look a bit more closely at the pollination and uh, the, the quantity of pollen required, this is a study on this species of Dianthus by um, Bloch. And you can see this graph here. On the bottom of the graph, on the bottom scale, we have the number of pollen grains. And on the vertical axis, we have the number of, the percentage of seed that is set. And you can see here that there is a threshold around about 50. And it's only after there's 50 grains of pollen or slightly more that actually seed is set. Therefore, if only one or two grains of pollen land on the female flower, it is very unlikely, if at all in this particular case, for seed to be set. And there has to be a threshold. And this seems to be true of a number of uh, plants that there's this threshold limit. So it is quantity that is often required, which will then ensure that the plant then is able to set seed. Now, trying to find out about pollination by Lepidoptera is not the easiest thing. It really is a, a mission impossible. Um, obviously trying to when I go out looking for butterflies and moths, uh, particularly looking for butterflies during the day, it's quite easy to find butterflies feeding at plants and nectaring, but how do you then prove that they're actually pollinating? Even more difficult to go out at night. Um, yes, it's possible to go out with a torch and see uh, various species of larger moth, of macro moth feeding on plants, um, feeding on the nectar. But how do you then prove that they are actually pollinating? So it's it's very, very difficult to, to do that. Yes, you can catch them and then you can look for pollen on their body. Um, but then trying to identify the pollen again or, and trying to extract the pollen from the body it is very, very difficult. So, so it is um, a difficult topic. And I think because of that, um, that is one of the reasons that it is very, very understudied. Um, so there's been re relatively few studies on the role of Lepidoptera in pollination. Uh, but I'm going to explain uh, some of the few papers that, and studies that there has been. Now, firstly, not every species of butterfly and moth will be pollinators. This wonderful group here, uh, garden tiger, 
emperor moth, two very common species in Scotland. Uh, Kentish glory on the right, of, despite its name, is only found in Scotland. It's not found elsewhere. It used to occur in Kent, but is now extinct. Last seen there in about the 1960s. Um, none of these species actually have any mouth parts. They do all their feeding at the caterpillar stage. So this is a female emperor moth. You can see her, uh, sorry, this is a, uh, and a, a, and a male Kentish glory here, and you can see the, the wonderful feathery antennae that they have, and they're using this to detect the females. But you will not find these species are nectaring on plants because they have no mouth parts. They have no need for that nectar, and therefore they do not uh, pollinate. We have a very small group of micro moths, my Coptrix that actually feed on pollen. Uh, these are very, very primitive moths. They're very, very small moths. You can see there on the right, this is my Coptrix calthella. Uh, very, very colourful species, wonderful bronzy golden colour with an orangey, uh, bright orange head. You often encounter these in the tops of buttercups. And they're not there wandering around, we think, pollinating. They're actually feeding on the pollen. So this is one of the few groups of moths, certainly in Britain, that are feeding on pollen. Now, when it comes to butterflies, this is an amazing photograph by one of our volunteers, Tam Stewart. Um, the, the butterflies are attracted to, to plants like Buddleia by their scent, by their colour. Um, certainly when I go out looking for, for butterflies, I tend to find more of them on purple and yellow flowers. Um, their compound eyes are probably able to um, d differentiate and detect those colours better. Um, butterflies have sensors. Uh, not only amazing sensors in their antennae, but also in their feet. So they are able to, to detect different plants and therefore they are able to uh, land on plants and with that scent and their visual clues on plants like Buddleia. And then they feed by uncoil uncoiling their proboscis, which is uh, like just like a drinking straw, and they therefore suck the nectar at the base of the plant or the base of the flowers out to feed. So that's what attracts them to, to these um, plants. But as I say, are they actually pollinating? How can you prove that they are pollinating? And that is the, that is the really difficult question. So first of all, when they are pollinating or when they are, sorry, when they are feeding on flowers, do they pick up the pollen? Uh, so this is a study by Jeniston. Um, and he found that of a study of looking in, at butterflies in Scandinavia, that there were 13 species that he found in a flower rich meadow that were carrying pollen. Um, and of these species, 73% of the individuals he caught had some pollen, but a number of them had very, very little pollen at all. In fact, the majority only had one grain. So if you think back to that wee graph that I showed you, yes, it might be picking up pollen, but the chances of it then using that one grain and pollinating a plant will be very, very slim, very, very marginal. However, one particular individual had 350 grains. So it's a sort of complex story, maybe some occurrences when the butterfly is feeding on the nectar, it might just pick up the odd grain. There may be whatever occasions when it's picking up a lot of grains and therefore that particular individual you would think would have a far greater chance of being of pollinating the plants. And the grains of uh, pollen that it was found were most in these open flowers. So things like scabious, things like devil's bit scabious, and they didn't find pollen from any other plants. In another study, um, Bloch found that there were five particular species of butterfly that were nectaring on this dianthus. This is the same dianthus as in the, the previous study, which has the graph in. But out of those five butterflies that they observed visiting these flowers regularly, 
there were only two that they regarded, these two here, the great sooty satire and marbled white, that they regarded as being important for pollination. They believed that the others were not pollinating, but by the amount of pollen on these two species and the fact that they were nectaring regularly on the dianthus, then these two got a big tick for pollinating uh, this particular dianthus. A study here by Wickland on wood white, a species that we sadly don't get in Scotland. It's quite a scarce species that occurs south of the border. Um, he found that uh, this particular butterfly particularly visited uh, violas and bitter vetch. So 90% of this butterfly's visits to nectar were on these species. However, when they then studied the actual individual butterflies more closely and looked at the pollen upon them, there was very little pollen. On average, only three grains. So they came to the conclusion that these particular species in this case were not aiding pollination at all. Uh, he described them as parasites. They were just there pinching the nectar, but not contributing anything to pollination. And a similar study over in America found with one of the species of long proboscis skippers that they were doing more or less exactly the same. They were stealing the nectar from their favoured plants without contributing anything to pollination. So they weren't picking up any or very, very low amounts of pollen and therefore were not uh, pollinating the plants. So this gives our butterflies a little bit of a bad name when it comes to, to pollination. Another study uh, found that uh, pollen can stay on butterflies, on their bodies, on their proboscis or on their heads or on their uh, thoraxes for quite long periods of time. Um, therefore, this shows that uh, species, migrant species like uh, Painted Lady, uh, the picture on the right is a narrow bordered bee hawk, um, it, quite similar to the hummingbird hawk moth, which can be a migrant species that occurs in Scotland from time to time. So, so butterflies that fly and moths that fly long distances can therefore move pollen over quite large areas from uh, plants, species in one area to, to others uh, further afield. So again, this could be very important in increasing that genetic diversity between the plant species and the fact that the pollen is on the, on the butterflies or moths for um, you know, some period of time. So, so far I've spoken about uh, butterflies. I now want to take you over to the dark side and talk about moths. Now I've mentioned a lot about nectar and that is the reason why uh, butterflies and, and in this case moths are attracted to the flowers. What you can do, being a mother, which I am, is that you can create your own nectar. And in mothing parlance, that is known as sugar. So when you go out and use this sugar, uh, you are, you are, the term is you are sugaring. And what you do is you mix these ingredients, so black treacle, uh, brown sugar, uh, some stout or ale and a tot of rum. You mix it up. And then with your paintbrush, you paint it on uh, vertical surfaces, so normally tree trunks. And it is amazing how the moths come and feed on that. So it is artificial nectar. It's very fickle. Sometimes it can work very, very well. Other times, uh, even though the conditions would appear similar, it doesn't seem to work at all. And in terms of recording moths, you can see on the right hand side a number of uh, different coloured moths, um, lesser broad bordered yellow underwings and large yellow underwings and pink barred sallows. It tends to work more when in the autumn and again in the spring. And for some species like red sword grass it, and its uh, scarcer cousin, the sword grass, um, it is probably the best way to actually record these species. So do moths carry pollen? So there's been a few studies, probably a handful of studies looking into this um, with fairly mixed results. So Devoto was looking uh, just up the road actually from me here. I'm based at home in King Usi, so he was looking in the Caledonian pine woods 
And there he found very low numbers of moths had pollen. So it was a two year study. And of in the first year, only 3% of those moths he caught and um, investigated had pollen. And in the second year, there were, it, was, it was higher, it was 10%. So not a high proportion. Whereas McGregor, who was looking in Oxford, doing transects, counter catching moths, he found a much higher percentage. So of the 609 moths that he caught and he observed closely, he found 23% of those had pollen. Whereas in Portugal, in a wonderful flower rich meadow, a much higher proportion of those moths. So 76% of 257 that were uh, caught and observed had pollen. So it seems to be a very mixed picture. Maybe it's due to the different habitats, maybe it's due to the abundance of nectar and therefore the abundance of pollen. Um, so it is a mixed picture between the species and between the habitats. Also, what we have to stress is although moths and butterflies might be found with pollen, it doesn't necessarily mean that they are actually pollinating. We come to a, a very specific example here of the greater butterfly orchid. Uh, this is work done by uh, done in Scotland. Um, now this wonderful uh, orchid, this wonderful uh, rare orchid is another species that Darwin was interested in. And he speculated that this orchid, this greater butterfly orchid, was pollinated by large night flying moths. And he based his proposition on the fact that the flowers are white and they show up at night, particularly at dusk. They give off a scent, particularly at night rather than during the day. And that the nectar is at the base of the long spur and that the only species that he thought would be able to get that nectar would be night flying moths. And you can see here, this is the uh, the plant, this is the long spur and the arrow there, you can see to the left, the, the colour of that tube is different and that is the nectar at the base of that tube. So for a moth to get that nectar, its proboscis has to be around about 28 millimetres long. But for the plant, if it's any longer, then it won't brush onto the pollinia. So these are the pollinia at the front of the orchid. This is what carries the pollen in orchids. It's a mass of pollen and it's very sticky. So what happens is that the, the moth will rub its nose, rub its face up against the flower so it can get inside with its proboscis to the nectar and then hopefully it as the flower is concerned, when the moth then flies away to another greater butterfly orchid, it is taking the pollinia with it. So because these are quite, these are very big, they're still a little bit difficult to see. It is relatively easy to uh, set moth traps and carefully go through the moths that you have caught and see whether there are any millennia on the on the body, particularly on the faces of these moths. So this is a burnished brass, um, a, a fairly common species throughout Scotland, and you can see here that it's got two pollinia on it. Also, it's you're able to identify the species of orchid from the pollinia. So it's possible to say that this burnished brass has been pollinating a greater butterfly orchid. And this work that was done by uh, uh, Sexton in uh, central Scotland, you can see here the species that he found that had pollinia on them from uh, greater butterfly orchid. And they are mostly the they are the larger moths that most of them are um, in, the, in a similar family. So gold spangle and beautiful golden wire, Lempty's gold spot silver white, gold spot and plain golden white and spectacle and burnished brass are all plusidae. So they're all in the same family. So they are obviously specialising in and have a sufficiently long proboscis to get the nectar from greater butterfly orchids and also pick up the pollinia. 
What's interesting is that large yellow underwing, which is a really, really common moth, probably one of our commonest moths in the summer, it was found with pollinia, but compared to the number that would have been around, very, very few, a very small proportion, only three of those that were caught were found to have the pollinia, whereas the gold spangle was found to be the, the main pollinator of this particular moth, of this particular orchid. So showing a strong relationship between the moths and this orchid. In another study uh, on the continent, uh, this time with the pyramidal orchid, um, you can see here, this is the pollinia that has been picked up by this particular moth. So again, it's a similar scenario. The moths will be going in with their proboscis, rubbing against the pollinia, and hopefully from the plant's point of view, going from flower to flower and spreading the pollen as it picks up the pollinia as it goes. So in this particular study, they found that there were 24 species of, uh, of butterfly and moth that um, had the pollinia uh, that they found pollinia on and that was uh, 20 percent seven percent of the species that they then caught had the pollinia so 24 species but of those only 27 percent of those they caught actually had pollinia but of those there were two main species that were found to be pollinating pyramidal orchid. So Zygena minos, which we don't have in uh, Scotland, in fact, we don't have in the UK, is very, very similar to transparent burnet, which is a very rare burnet moth that only occurs in the UK on the west of Scotland. Um, and black veined white, another species that we don't have in Scotland. So you'll, you see there that out of those 24 species, these were the two main butterflies and moths that were pollinating pyramidal orchid and 50% of all the zygena minus they caught had pollen pollinia whereas 21% of the black veined white did. The other thing that they did is mark release recapture. Now this is a method that can be used uh, to use to look at the dispersal of butterflies and moths as well as trying to estimate population size. So you can mark with, uh, with paint or with in indelible markers, you can carefully mark moths and butterflies on the wing. You can do it in a way that you can mark them individually. And what you do is that you go and catch a, a number of them, you mark them, and then you go back a number of days later and then you try and recatch them. And you can therefore see, because they've been marked individually, you can see how far they have moved. So they did this with the, these particular two species that were the main pollinators of um, the pyramidal orchid. And what they found was that the, the zygena hardly moved at all. So the burnet moth literally just moved sort of tens of meters. Whereas the black veined white moved over far greater distances and the, the furthest that one traveled was six kilometers but on average they traveled 300 meters so that shows how these species are moving around the landscape and pollinating and adding to that genetic diversity uh, over quite a large scale i mean six kilometers is quite a distance for a butterfly to travel so it's adding to that genetic uh, diversity of the plant species Another orchid, a small white orchid, a very small orchid. Um, this has been found to be pollinated by grass moths. They're in the Crambidae family, particularly Crambus lathayanellus. So this is a very, very common moth. Uh, there's, this is a group, the grass moth is a group uh, of which maybe half a dozen of them are probably one of the commonest moths in Scotland. Um, that you'll see them if you walk through any long grass in the summer. Clouds of small pale moths will get up amongst your feet and virtually all of those will be uh, crambidae, uh, grass moths. And this particular species is one of the ones that comes out quite early. It's relatively easy to identify because it has this wonderful uh, go faster stripe down its body that's got a slight fork in it. And it was this common species of moth, Crambus lathionellus, that was responsible, along with a few very small flies, for pollinating small white orchid. So when it comes to the, to the night shift, um, 
recent studies, I mean, this is very fresh off the press, recent studies by Walton and his colleagues, you can see there, has shown that um, the networks of moths pollinating is very, very complex, far more complex than bees. And he found that 45% of moths that they caught were, had pollen on them from 40, and these came from 47 different species of plant. And a lot of these plants were not visited by the usual suspect pollinators of bees and, and hoverflies, and therefore moths would be very, very important pollinators of those specific uh, plants. Now, most of the studies have found that the pollen has been taken, uh, ad adhered to the butterfly or moth on the head or on the proboscis. But this work by Funamoto in Japan actually found that the very hairy bodies of moths collected vast amounts of pollen. So as they're going into the into the flower to get the nectar, a lot of pollen, probably very similar to the bumblebee photograph I showed you, and that the hairy bodies are important at picking up the pollen and then spread it, spreading it from plant to plant and therefore presumably aiding pollination. So I think the key message here is that uh, moths Yes, butterflies and moths may not be the most important pollinators, certainly not when it comes to crops. But, uh, you know, at night they are vastly important and they really help keep the diverse populations of um, plants. Um, they add to that, they ensure that that diverse community is still there and keeping its abundance. So, Hopefully, it's been a bit of a uh, a bit of a whiz through some of the studies. Um, it shows, in many respects, how little work has been done on the pollination of our wonderful butterflies and moths. Um, shows how much more there is to be done. Um, hopefully, I've explained some of the specialist roles that coevolution between specific uh, plants and their their pollinator. And I think now we're beginning to realise how important particularly moths can be at pollinating our native plants. But there's far more studies to be done. And I think this is probably just the start of that understanding. So um, I'm happy if I can to try and answer any questions. Thank you very much for listening. Um, and if you want to know more about butterfly conservation, you'll see uh, there's our website at the top of the page. I'll stop presenting. Thank you very, Thank much, you very Tom. much, Tom. That was, that was, uh, uh, that was a fascinating, fascinating talk. talk. Really, really, really interesting, interesting subject. subject. Um, um, I'm just having a look at the uh, conversation. Uh, we've not got any questions come through as yet, but there's certainly a few points that I was particularly interested in that you raised that I'd like to ask you a little bit more about. Um, if you can, if you wouldn't mind, um, if anybody else does have any questions, then feel free to fire them through on the conversation or raise your hands. Um, but I'd be interested, um, I mean, one one point that you made, Tom, towards the end, uh, particularly is the, the, the la you know, the lack of research, the fact that so little is still known. And the reason that I discussed this subject with you in the first place was because it was something I was particularly interested in um, knowing more about. And I guess I didn't really fully appreciate how little had been done into this particular subject so um from that sense it is very interesting to to hear you know from your research um and and summary of the literature that is out there so far um how little is understood and and you know how much is is still to be done the the particular report that you made reference to um at the end the paper that you made reference to in 2020 um i found particularly interesting 45 percent of moths tested um, were transporting pollen and 47 different plants, many of which weren't visited by other pollinators. Uh, that, that is a particularly 
interesting statistic in in the fact that they're um, adding adding effort to adding pollination effort to uh, the biodiversity, the overall biodiversity of the ecosystem in in ways that other pollinating insects aren't doing. Um, so they they obviously are playing a role, however um, uh, small that role may be. But uh, yeah, I, I'd be interested to to look that paper up. Actually, I will have a look for it. Um, yeah, well, I, I'm I'm happy to provide those that want uh, the the references that I've found. I've not got full references for all of them, but um, I, I have got you know full references for some. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, Tom, if if you wouldn't mind sending me through whatever references you do have, and then I'd be quite happy to share that information with uh, those um, in attendance uh, at a later date. I'd be I'd be quite happy to do that if um, if you were able to. Uh, yeah, no, certainly, and and I think as you say that it it's good from that study to show that that moths have uh, an play an important role in pollination because I think to many people they're just seen as uh, bat food or bird food. Yeah, yeah. Um, there are a few questions coming in, Tom. Um, so I'll go through. Hang on, bear with me one moment. Uh, so a question from Rebecca Lewis, what's the most important step a community can take to ensure pollinators survive? Oh, well, uh, well, I think it, it's growing native plants, so native flowers, so a species rich meadow, um, you know, which will attract, well it will, it will do a, a number of things, you know, it will provide nectar, so it, it will provide food for pollinating insects, it will attract them in, but also they will be, if they're native plants, they will be uh, food plants of the early stages of butterflies and moths and other insects. So I think it's going native. Um, certainly when it comes to planning where these areas are, then having them in shelter, certainly in Scotland, it's very important to try and get them in sunny sheltered locations. Ideally make sure that they're linked together and also ensure that they're properly managed. It's quite easy to go and sow a few wild flower seeds and get them established but then it's that constant management that can be very difficult because a lot of these species like uh, low levels of um, sort of fertilizer and if sites are too enriched then other weeds and thicker grasses come in um, and also if it is a community uh, site and it's close to the council road verges or green areas then uh, try and prevent them from cutting them uh, you know several times a year so that they probably require one or two cuts a year and ideally take the cuttings off so that they're not adding to the uh, they're not neutrifying the, the site yeah I, I, ju I just add to that that there are a lot of resources available through both the bug life and butterfly conservation websites relating to the creation of wildflower meadows and uh, and wildlife friendly management of areas like um, allotments and community gardens and that sort of thing. So, uh, if you are keen to um, to uh, you know, promote pollination, insect pollination particularly, then um, have a look at the the bug life and the butterfly conservation websites and um, see if you can locate some of those resources. Um, a question from Nobin Ram. Uh, in the comparison of the three studies, do you know why Devoto's study has only shown three to 10% of moths carrying pollen in Scotland? Was it because of the difference in Scottish habitat compared to the Portuguese? Uh, yeah, yes, to be honest, I don't know, but I suspect that probably ha is one of the reasons um you know our, our pine woods are wonderful habitats um uh, but the the number of plants beneath them it, on the whole is fairly limited um so it may be that it's just reflecting the the lower diversity of plants and the fact that there would be a higher diversity in a wonderful species rich meadow on the continent and therefore you might expect uh, you know a, a number of different uh, pollinators it, it could be that but yes i'm not quite sure why but it but i think it shows that pollination in different habitats by lepidoptera is at different levels so there's not one sort of one size fits all as it were yeah 
there, there was a there was a notable difference, but also a notable difference in the three habitats, wasn't there? So that that habitat in Portugal, obviously, with an abundance of wildflowers in that meadow, um, there, there was more pollen around. So you're bound to find a bit more pollen on the on the moths, aren't you? Grant, um, a question from Alan Kerr. Uh, were the percentage of moths as pollinators usually related to species rather than individual moths? Uh, I think it, I think it was in some cases it was individual moths. So when species were found, it was then you know that the percentage given was the percentage of that of individuals of that species that were found to be carrying pollen. Okay. Uh, I'm just scrolling through the chat. There are a, a lot of people are saying excellent, excellent talk. Thank you, Tom. Um, uh, Jamie Wildman, a question has come through. You touched briefly on the role skippers play in pollination. I'm studying the checkered skipper in England and wondered how effective you think it is at pollinating a primary nectar source like bugle. Well, yes, to be honest, I, I don't know. Certainly it's a species in Scotland that um, you find regularly nectaring. You know, that is the way to find it. You know, in our climate, you need to go out on that in those wee brief sunny spells in the spring and you're, you're scouring patches, particularly of uh, marsh, thistle and bugle. Now, whether it is like in the case that I gave in America, whether it's a, a robber of nectar and stealing the nectar without pollinating or whether it's actually pollinating, I'm afraid I don't know. But it would be interesting to to look at that. But certainly they, they do nectar um, abundantly. Mm -hmm. um, a, a comment from Lynn, her, uh, she was having uh, computer issues and she was asking, uh, was there anything about the importance of trees and pollen and pollination or was it all the research on plant flowers? Uh, Lynn, just a, a, a point on that. Like, as I said at the beginning of the presentation, um, I, have, I have recorded the presentation and it will be made available through the Bug Life website um, in due course in the next week or two. So uh, you will be able to look back over the whole presentation yourself. Um, at a later date, but I don't know if there's anything you want, any comment you want to make on that question, Tom? Yeah, yes, no, I, um, I, I did mention, you know, pines be, uh, and their pollen being um, wind dispersed. I don't think I gave any examples of, of flowering trees, but yes, they are as important as, um, you know, flowering plants. So, you know, things like willows, um, you know, they produce a, an abundance of flower and, and nectar that is um, so, uh, which is very, very um, strongly attracted to, or, or a lot of uh, Lepidoptera and other pollinators are strongly attracted to them. Uh, and things like, you know, hawthorns and, and other, you know, flowering trees will, you know, require pollination. Yeah. Uh, Jamie has just said thank you for your answer, Tom. Something to look into here in Rockingham Forest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, good luck. <laughs> uh, there, there is plenty to look into, that's for sure. Um, you had uh, mentioned Roy Sexton and the work that he had done into Greater Butterfly Orchid. Um, I, I spent some time working at Loch Leven, and I know that Roy had taken a great interest in the Lesser Butterfly Orchid um, that we had growing on the site here and wondered whether or not Roy had actually published any of the research um, that he had conducted whilst visiting Loch Leven. I don't know whether there was any reference to lesser butterfly orchid in his studies or if it was exclusively greater butterfly orchid that you had been referring to. And particularly with reference to the Plutidae moths, I never realised that they were um, they were adapted to, to pollinate uh, orchids specifically. Uh, yes, I think the the study I had, I think, was on greater butterfly orchid. It, it was, a, I think, it was a twenty. I might be wrong, but about a twenty fourteen paper. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't find anything else of, of Roy's, but um, I must admit I didn't look that thoroughly. But I can send you what I've uh, what I've got. It will be in the in the list. Okay. 
Yeah, yeah. I'd be, I'd just be into. I never, I never found out whether or not because uh, I left Loch Leven a, a while ago now, around about 2014, as it happens. But um, I never found out whether or not any of the research came to anything um, that he had been uh, looking into, and, and the lesser butterfly orchid, anyway. So yeah, it'd be interesting to. to I know, I know a few people that know Roy, anyway. So um, I'll be able to find out uh, whether any more has come of that. But, um, Grand. And yeah, in, in, in relation to that, the uh, the Star of Bethlehem Orchid, I found that fascinating. That was that was really interesting. Um, oh, I am uh, sorry, Jennifer. I've just seen another comment has come through. Would you be able to share the links you mentioned earlier, Craig? I, uh, Tom, before you arrived, I had said that I was going to share a couple of links um for uh people and they were for uh, the bug life events page and uh the scottish invertebrate news so if you don't mind i'm just going to post them into the comments section again um because i did so at the beginning but um i think a lot of people that weren't already in the meeting will have missed them so uh, for those of you that did miss them, there's the links to the events page for Bug Life and um, the registration form for the Scottish Invertebrate newsletter um, that comes out monthly. So if you'd wish to sign up for that, then please feel free to fill in that form. Um, I'm going to be emailing a, a feedback questionnaire, a very short questionnaire, just a few questions. Um, uh, at the end of this uh, this this presentation, so if you wouldn't mind filling that out and sending it back, that would be fantastic. Um, I do have another question that's come in, Tom. Uh, slight diversion. Do you know where I can find information on wasps pollination? <laughs> um, yeah, I'm afraid not. I I was just yes looking really for Lepidoptera. I, I didn't. Uh, Apart from, you know, the um, fig wasp, I didn't really find anything else, but I wasn't really looking. I just sadly ignored uh, any other pollinators. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there, there's there's a lot of information on the Bug Life website um, about pollination in general. And, uh, you know, there there is some information on um, wasps, but uh, specific wasp pollination, you would need to... Um, delve into some research uh, yourself and see what you can dig up. I would think, as as Tom had to do um, with this this challenging topic that I presented him with. <laughs> um, uh, another another comment has come in from Nobin. Um, thank you for answering that. As a student, which uh, which field, e.g., zoology. And anthropology, biology, etc., could be the best to start a career in areas currently not fully understood in moths. Wow, yes. <laughs> any. <laughs> um, I mean, I suppose my bias is is more sort of species focused. You know, I, I work on a, a lot of our rare species and even just the fundamentals of what they do and their food plants and the um, intricacies of their their life histories is really poorly known. So when I'm trying to sort of give advice to to farmers and landowners, it's really on a on a gut feeling rather than any science so we do try to encourage you know um, students to take on some of our, our projects um, so that, that we can find out more about uh, you know some of our higher priority species that are in most urgent need of um, you know conservation so I don't know whether I answered it but uh, the question no, I, on I, I think that's a that's a very good point and the the one of the reasons I find the the topic so fascinating is that a lot of it is based on assumptions and you know we see butterflies we see particular insects visiting particular flowers and therefore assume that they play a major role in pollination and and I think what um, you've highlighted in, in your presentation is that a lot more needs to be done a lot more needs to you know we need to study it in, in a great deal more detail uh, before we fully understand rather than making these assumptions that, that I guess 
many people already have made. Um, yeah, I think the the genealogy and the reference that you made to um, genetic diversity of uh, various species of plant, I think that plays a, a key role in 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 the insect pollination and well the role of insects in pollination and um, ensuring uh, continued genetic diversity of many plants is is seems to me to be very important. Um, so yeah, I think that's a that's a very interesting subject that more research could be done into. Grant, um, it looks to me that that's all of our questions answered for now, Tom. Um, I'm happy to forward any further questions that any anybody that's uh, um, any attendees have um, for you. If anybody else wishes to ask any questions, feel free to email me directly. Like I said at the beginning of the presentation as well, please let me know if you've had any difficulties accessing the the talk itself or registering for the talk i'd be interested to know just so that i can improve um, the the future workshops and presentations that i'm going to be organizing um, but for now um i'd like to echo the many comments that are coming through in the uh, conversation tom and and thank you for your presentation for your time this morning um i and everybody else it would seem has uh, really enjoyed uh, what you've had to say and um yeah thank you very much for your time okay yep thank you thank you for listening okay and thank you all for uh attending i hope you can make some events in the future okay oh. yep bye oh, thanks tom cheers bye